Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. <laughs> so I'm Catherine McKinley, and I'm new here, but I already brought my first visitor, Steve Blackburn, who's been my uh, colleague and collaborator now for 12 years, and still going strong. <laughs> so he, uh, one of his cl many claims to fame is he's implemented hundreds of garbage collection algorithms, and he's going to talk about one today. And he's been the leader of the DeCapo benchmark. Uh, effort which in which our research group put together a bunch of Java benchmarks so people can actually measure and do research on garbage collection and Java Java uh, research virtual machines. He's a professor at the Australian National University right now and uh, and he's here for a couple days where we were supposedly going to work on papers but we'll see what happens <laughs> and um, and he brought wine. <laughs> and he's taking Australian wine, and he's taking back with him uh, parts to do uh, power measurements, which many of you saw uh, was a collaborator on the work that I interviewed and got a job on. And uh, and I'm going to abandon him because I have both his collaborator on this work, and I've given this talk enough times that I don't need to see him. And I've seen him give it several times too. And I have a paper deadline, so that's my rude introduction. <laughs> Well, thank you, Catherine. All right, so I've decided what I, that for fun what I would do here, because I knew Catherine had already stolen my thunder with uh, during her interviews, giving uh, talks that uh, about a, a lot of our current work. So rather than repeat our current work when I visit, I thought what I'd do is give a talk about uh, a garbage collector that we presented at PLDI a couple of years ago, and then break uh, st st at the end of that talk, which is just a thirty-minute conference talk. Um, move on to something more interesting, and that is the work that we're currently doing, which is not published. So the idea there is that um, I probably don't, re don't want that recorded. Um, uh, I don't really want to be scooped on all this, but it's more speculative, more out there, more open to discussion, and uh, hopefully more interesting for you all to see what we're doing right now, because uh, I think we're doing quite a few interesting things. And we're talking to a number of people here and, um, uh, and David Tardidi's group over um, and I work in Midori about some of these things, and I, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. So <clears throat> I'm just throwing a few seeds out there. Hopefully some of them you'll find interesting. And I'm very interested uh, in the possibility of following up with this and talking to you more about it later. But let me start with a more formal talk from a conference presentation. This, uh, before I get into the talk proper, let me just give you a little bit of background. We gave this talk at PLDI two years ago, I think. Um, and uh, it's been well received. It's now in... Uh, production use in three virtual machines, two Java virtual machines, and also in GHC, the, the Glasgow Haskell compiler. Well, at least I read a paper on, uh, at ISMM a few months ago which says that, that they're now using the Zeta Fault Collector. So, so it's, it's, it's had a little bit of impact, um, <coughs> and I also find this a fun talk, so that's why I thought I'd choose this one to give here. Um, all right, feel free to interrupt me, uh, ask any questions as we go along, and uh, let's get started. All right, so this was, a, uh, this was the opening line of uh, one of the first reviews we got for this paper. <laughs> and uh, I just thought to myself, it was at ASPLOS, right? So I thought to myself, this, uh, this review has got to be an architect, right? But uh, no, GC is not really retro. Um, it really did make us think a little bit about what, what this paper was about, though. And um, I'm going to forewarn you uh, retrophobes amongst you that, that the three algorithms we're going to focus on today are um, Mark Sweep, <coughs> uh, Mark Compact, and Cheney, uh, Cheney's uh, semi-space algorithm. So, um, indeed, this is a slightly retro paper, but this reflects the fact that garbage collection has got deep roots. So um, the talk is going to be about fundamentals, but it's going to take from those fundamentals, take us into something new, something that's, that's, that's now actually a very much state of the art. Um, I do want to reassure you, for those of you who are not aware of it, uh, that GC is very much alive and well, and um, the uptake of garbage collected languages continues to climb. And in fact, here's a quote 
that was contemporary at the time that we wrote the paper um, that said something um, about the state of uh, languages. And it says gar languages without garbage uh, collection are getting out of fashion, which I thought was a nice juxtaposition to the reviewer's comment. Um, so that's where we're at. Now, let me move quickly to what our objective is. What are we on about in this talk? The first and most important thing you need to understand about garbage collection is that it fundamentally represents time-space trade-off. Okay? So you're spending time to regain space. That's the, that's the basic equation. Um, and so this, in fact, is, a, is actually a, a cartoon, uh, but the data there is actually real data from uh, real GC algorithms, and, and the, the goal in this paper is to do this. Okay? Pull, the, pull the curve down this way to get more space for less time. <coughs> so let's start with a brief big picture tutorial on garbage collection. Um, <coughs> a GC algorithm can be broken down into three algorithmic components. First, how objects are allocated. Second, how garbage is identified. And third, how space is reclaimed. Okay. So there, there are two fundamental approaches to allocation. There's what we know as the free list. You, many of you will be familiar with malloc and free, which traditionally uses a free list. And uh, objects are allocated off some list, and, and um, when they're freed up, they're placed back on that list. The challenge there is to find the right size unit on that list and to organize that list appropriately so that you can efficiently do that. <coughs> and the alternative is, the fundamental alternative is bump allocation. Bump allocation says, find some space of unused memory, and then simply monotonically allocate into that space. Nice and simple. Now, with respect to identification, there are two fundamental choices. There's what the literature refers to as implicit identification. So we identify dead stuff by explicitly identifying live stuff. Therefore, we're implicitly identifying the dead stuff. And the way we do that is through transitive closure, which is a conservative approximation for liveness. Okay, so we perform a transitive closure from some set of known roots and traverse the pointers in the heap, identifying those things that are live. <coughs> and then we sweep away the things that are not identified, so we're implicitly identifying the garbage. The fundamental alternative is reference counting, which is also referred to as explicit identification, and this simply maintains a count of uh, pointers to each object, and when the count falls to zero, you've explicitly identified it as being unreachable, and therefore it is dead, and therefore you can reclaim it. Reference counting has got an Achilles heel in that it doesn't have a way of directly collecting cycles, so you need some backup mechanism to deal with that. We're not going to talk further about reference counting here, although we are actually, this, this IMIX work, I've got a graduate student right now working on um, time, marrying it together with reference counting, and that's something we, we, I, I spent a, a bit of time yesterday talking with the Maduri team about, because it, it may have relevance to some of the challenges they've got with uh, garbage collection. But we're not going to talk about it further here. <coughs> and then reclamation. Um, we, we've classified reclamation into, into, into three, three classes. Um, the first we call sweep to free. And what that means is I find the things that, that have been, are dead and, and, and sweep them up and put them onto a free list. Okay? And that, that's a classic way Mark's sweep algorithm will work. Um, it'll sweep things up and put them onto a free list. Another approach is what we call compaction. And um, what that means is it will uh, move... Uh, all the live objects that remain in some space across to uh, move them, slide them over the top of the dead objects. So you've compacted the space. Okay? If you think about that, that's actually not trivial. Okay? Because you, you have, you're, you're moving objects within one space. By contrast, what we call evacuation means uh, simply identifying the live objects and copying them out into a new space. Okay? This is a lot simpler conceptually. Um, well, at least the implementation-wise, it's a lot simpler. Uh, but it has the, as you can see from the, the cartoon there, it has the uh, obvious uh, uh, overhead of requiring additional space in which to copy in the first place. Okay, and s people sometimes refer to both of these sort of semi-ambiguously as copying algorithms. We've, we've, crisp we've tried to crisply differentiate evacuation from compaction. Um, both, of them, both of them imply copying. <coughs> okay. Um, so, uh, the, these, these uh, mechanisms have in the literature 
uh, been uh, fleshed out in three canonical algorithms that you'll pick up in any GC textbook or uh, you know, any, any class about garbage collection. And they are mark and sweep, which combines a free list with tracing and sweep to three. So notice that we're now composing that set of, uh, of uh, design alternatives I outlined on the previous slide are now being composed into algorithms. And so the first is mark sweep, which is free list, trace, and sweep to free. Then we've got mark compact, which composes bump allocation with tracing and compaction. And finally, we have semi-space, which composes bump allocation with tracing and evacuation. So uh, that's my, my way of tutorial for how we build up these classic uh, algorithms by a simple composition of some very fundamental components. <clears throat> now, let's take a quick look <clears throat> Uh, at these three fundamental collectors, and starting with Mark Sweep. And what we're going to do is we're going to present four different perspectives on the collector performance. Um, we're going to start with uh, the mutator, the collector performance, uh, the minimum heap size, which is another very important metric for a garbage collector, and the total performance. So garbage collection people tend to see the application as the adversary, so we refer to the application as the mutator, uh, traditionally. I, I think Dijkstra coined that term. Um, um, it, it's often underappreciated that collection policies, that is the policy by which you collect, can affect the performance of the mutator, okay, as opposed to the performance of the collector. So you can, the, the choice of garbage collection policy can have an indirect effect on the way the mutator behaves. So we want to explicitly evaluate the mutator behavior as distinct from the collective behavior. And we look at the, 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 the whole. Um, one reason for this, as, as some of you might be guessing, is that the locality properties of the uh, different allocation strategies can have performance implications for the mutator. <clears throat> okay, so let's have a look at, at mark and sweep. First of all, we see that it's got very poor mutator performance. Time uh, higher is worse because time is uh, the the y-axis, so higher is worse, and you see that the, relative to the other, other two canonical algorithms, uh, mutate, the mutated time for mark sweep is poor. Um, uh, on the other hand, the garbage collection um, time is, is the best. It, it's got the best garbage collection time of, of the lot, uh, mark and sweep, because it's got a very simple collection strategy. Um, it's also pretty space efficient. It's uh, not as uh, space efficient as mark compact, but it's, it's a lot more space efficient than semi-space. Um, as I said, it's got very poor locality, but overall, um, its performance was, uh, the total performance was the best of those three classic algorithms. <clears throat> now, let's look at Mark Compact, and we see a different story here. We see that it's got great locality, okay, and, and if you think about what I, the way I explained how compaction works, you might understand that what one property that induces is that objects are left uh, at least approximately in allocation order, always. Okay, because you slide them across as, as, as objects die. So you leave them in allocation order, and that induces a good locality properties. Interesting to note that semi-space has even better locality. Now, that's because semi-space copies out and will copy into tra in traversal order. So it'll put things that are connected next to each other. Okay, so you'll see here that, it, that the locality of, the, of good mark compact is good, but not quite as good as semi-space. Um, uh, mark compact, unsurprisingly, is very space efficient. But... The collection uh, cost for Mark Compact is, is significant because uh, it's a non-trivial algorithm and, uh, and so that's its Achilles heel. Finally, we can look at semi-space and uh, the mut as I mentioned before, the, the mutated performance is excellent because uh, it, it induces great locality and um, unfortunately, however, it's very space inefficient. Okay, so if you were paying attention, you would have noticed that as I listed each of the three canonical algor algorithms, each of them had a very obvious Achilles heel. So the goal of our work, of course, is to see if we can come up with uh, an algorithm, a fundamental algorithm, um, that avoids all of these, these problems. <clears throat> and that's what, um, that, that, that's what I'm going to talk about now. And, and we first started doing this when uh, Catherine and I worked with Perry Chang on a paper at Sigmetrics where we did this deep analysis of all the classic garbage collection algorithms who looked at their cache performance and so forth. And we always w were struggling to try and find, it seemed, it, it seemed like there must be a way 
to do better than, the, than, than, than this in terms of a fundamental algorithm. And, um, that, and that's what we've been working on. That's what I'm going to present now. So I'm going to present on this slide here uh, a new reclamation strategy. It's actually not entirely new. It's, uh, it was new to us and it's new in the literature, but uh, there are algorithms in um, two of the uh, production garbage collectors in, in industry which actually appear to be um, instances of this style of collector. The, um, the one that was made by BEA, which was then subsumed by Oracle, that um, I'm not sure what the status of that, that collector is now, the J-Rocket collector. That one and um, one version of the, an earlier version of one of the IBM collectors also exhibited this behavior. And it's what we call sweep to region. <coughs> and so by contrast to these other three, the way sweep to region works is that um, <coughs> you break the space up into regions. In this cartoon here, I've just got two regions. But of course, you can imagine in a heap you'd have many more than two. And then what you do is when you do your trace, you mark not only the object, but the region that contains it and you free regions which are not marked at all. Okay, so, and mark region is the algorithm that follows from the application of uh, this reclamation strategy by combining it with bump allocation and tracing. Okay, and mark region is what we're going to talk about today, and imix, if you like, is an instantiation of that class of algorithm. <coughs> Alright, so I'm, now I'm going to give you a sneak preview of our the bottom line results that we'll present at the end of this talk, just to motivate you so you haven't, don't fall asleep too quickly. Um, and so what, is, what does this new algorithm do? Well, it gets great locality. It's uh, about as good as, um, as my compact. It has um, very good garbage collection performance. It's almost exactly the same as um, Mark Sweet, which is the best of the, uh, of the garbage collectors. Um, it, has, it is very space efficient. It's nearly as space efficient as Mark Compact, which was the best in terms of space efficiency. And unsurprisingly, once you put those together, what you end up with is um, a very efficient collector. <coughs> so now let's have a look at how this collector works. I'll start with a naive explanation of how it works. And, and for the minute, you'll just have to, have to believe me when I tell you that, in fact, um, some of the things that you might see as obvious problems with this are things that we finesse later on in the talk. So let's just start with a naive version of this uh, collector. <coughs> First of all, we have contiguous allocation into a set of regions. So you imagine the heap is the green thing. We break it up into regions. There are four regions there. Um, of course, in a real heap, you'd have very many more than four regions. And um, we've allocated across there. Um, this, of course, gives us excellent locality allocation time because you've got contiguous allocation. There's no free list. So it's very much, at this point, it's very much like a semi space or a mark compact in terms of locality, which is exactly what you saw on the previous slide. Um, <coughs> to make things simple, we've said that objects can't span regions. Now, if objects are small relative to the region size, that's not really going to be a significant limitation. So um, then we have a simple mark phase. <coughs> which is just like the um, mark sweep mark phase, except that except for one, one difference. We also put a mark on the region as well as the mark on the object. So um, we go and mark the objects that are live and we mark the containing regions. And then um, we can free the regions that haven't been marked. And then we're free to allocate in those again. Okay, that is the essence of the algorithm. Everything else that follows, that's mark region, if you like. That's the fundamental algorithm. Everything else that follows is um, engineering, essentially, to make this thing actually work really efficiently. Now, for me, the cool thing was when, when we implemented this um, to start with, we found that for a good many benchmarks, that naive uh, algorithm actually worked extremely well. Of course, the, 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 the problem was the pathology. So there are a few benchmarks for which it, it really didn't work well at all. And so what, what follows in this engineering is essentially working out how to um, um, ensure against the various pathologies that can arise from something as naive as this. But this naive algorithm actually works pretty well. <coughs> so as I said, now we're going to talk about IMEX, which is an efficient instantiation of this general algorithm. So the, the most important idea in IMIX is that we don't just have regions like I, I sketched earlier, but rather we have a, a, a two-level hierarchy, which we, we call lines and blocks. And we use the term lines and blocks, and they roughly connote to um, microarchitectural locality, i.e. a cache line, and operating system level locality, i.e. a page. Okay, so a block is roughly connotes to a page, and a line roughly connotes to a cache line. Okay, the exact sizing of those things is 
something something you can tune, although we, we find that our algorithm is pretty robust to the precise sizing of these things. But that's the, that, that's the intuition you should uh, work with as we go through this talk. So um, the motivation for it comes this way. Uh, if, if we had really large regions, okay, what would happen if we had really large regions? We, just, we didn't have lines and blocks, we just had really large regions. Well, the, the b benefit of that would be that we'd have more contiguous allocation. Obviously, the bigger it is, the, the, the longer we get to go before we have to stop, okay? If, if we've got this rule that we can't span regions. <coughs> but we, we've got a fragmentation problem due to false marking, right? So we, we've said that both those re regions there are alive, and yet the one on the right, well, both of them are, are, are fairly sparse. And the bigger you get, then the more exposed you are to this problem of fragmentation. You only need one object to ruin your day, right? So uh, there's this tension. You, 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 on one hand, you want to make the regions really big, so you can do a lot of allocation before you have to stop. On the other hand, you want to make them pretty small, so you're not wasting too much space when you do this conservative marking. Okay, fairly fundamental trade-off and a fairly obvious tension. So how do we get around this? Well, <clears throat> well, sorry. The, the, the alternative is if we have small regions, you you you'll, you will find that um, you're going to struggle to fit objects in. So um, you, also you've got an uh, an increased metadata overhead. If you assume there's some overhead associated with each region, then that overhead will um, um, be more exposed as the region size shrinks. And um, you won't be able to fit objects into blocks because in the limit your, uh, your, your region will um, be so small that the object won't fit. And um, you won't be able to have objects of a certain size because they won't fit into your region. So that's what's constraining us in the other direction. So we've got this, this, this ugly tension if you approach things naively, like I sketched earlier. So what we do, as I mentioned earlier, is we break, break the world up into lines and blocks. <clears throat> and um, we don't allow objects to span blocks, but we do allow, allow them to span lines. So the, 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 the trick is, how can, how can we do this efficiently? Um, so we get to allocate contiguously, uh, just skipping over the blocks. And um, when we mark, we, we, we mark lines as being live rather than marking blocks as being live. When we reclaim, um, we get to reclaim entire blocks, but we also get to reclaim lines. Okay, so if an entire line is unmarked, then we can reclaim that line. Now, the advantage of this distinction is that if we have an entire block, if those of you who are garbage collection heads or work with memory management at all will appreciate the importance of the distinction between microarchitectural locality and operating system resource management, the operating system will like to have whole pages back because they can be reused by something else. Um, um, so that's why there's a, an important distinction being able to being able to free something up at that granularity versus the usefulness of having a little line in which you can squish a few more objects. So, so, so both of these have different roles, if you like. Um, so whenever we have a block free, we can give that back to the OS if that's what we want to do. We can't give this back to the OS uh, because uh, an OS can't see resolve inside of a page. Um, but this we can reuse ourselves. We can't reuse this, but we can reuse that. Um, <coughs> yeah, go there. Parse the heap to continuously yeah. walk in, in such a fine granularity. Um, yeah, th th there's a neat trick, um, and, and 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 in term so lines are fixed size. That's the first important property. Then we put a restriction on object size. Okay, that might sound restrictive, but in practice, any garbage collector, most garbage collectors, differentiate the vast bulk of objects, which are fairly small in the order of tens of bytes, maybe 30 bytes, 40 bytes, something like maybe 100 bytes, from those that are big, you know, page size objects. There's a very sharp distinction between those in most garbage collectors. So what we do is we say an object can't be bigger than a line. Um, oh, sorry. No, we allow them to span lines. But the point is what we do is we, we have different marking strategies for when we allocate so we know if an object has spanned a line. That's, that, that's, a, that's the key trick, which allows us to very quickly identify which lines are free. Your concern would be what lines are free, I think, Dave. That's, that's essentially, how do we know which lines are free? Is that your, is that your concern, Dave? We don't need to know, we don't need to know where the, where the holes are except at the resolution of a line. We just need to know that line there is definitely free. 
okay? And, and, and the way we do that is what we call conservative marking. We, we take a conservative approach by always marking the thing immediately behind an object, which I'll, I'll mention in a minute. But that's the way we resolve what I think is the problem you're, you're getting at. Here's the precise problem I'm worried about. If the, in the second region, the second line, the object that's spanning from the first to the second line, yes. if it didn't go to the end of the second line, and then you decided the third line was free, and you allocated in it. That's right. What would you, that's how right. would you then parse that yeah. region? Right, right. So, um, so it's, uh, the short answer is, objects that um, span more than one line are a special case, and we deal with that at allocation time, and they're rare. Um, so, uh, the, so you're, you're talking about a problem, and I'm saying that that problem is actually rare. And because we, we know empirically that it is rare, then we can, we can afford to do a little bit more expensive allocation time to put your problem aside. Okay, but we, the details should be clearer soon. Okay, so part of uh, so so the, this part of the talk is really about engineering, and and what that means is looking at demographics and understanding the common cases, the frequent cases, and then. Um, uh, engineering um, the system to uh, be very, very fast in the common case and deal gracefully for the the difficult cases. Okay, and that, that's the essence of oh, that's the es essence of this part of the talk. Okay, um, <clears throat> so uh, how do we recycle? Well, you, th you wonder how what strategy do we have for deciding how to reuse this and how do we reuse that, or versus how to reuse a completely fresh block. So we spent ages worrying about this and wondering what the best strategy was. Turns out the best strategy uh, was very the most simple one, and that is to simply give back all the completely free things to the operating system or give them back to, to, the, to a shared pool uh, so they could be used by other things as well, which gives them maximum utility. Um, and then for the recycling ones, sim we simply went in an address order, and that was just as smart as any other much more convoluted strategy which we'd come up with, like going for the oldest one or the most densely packed one, or we had all these different uh, heuristics that might give, give a better result. We found the most effective result was simply to go in address order, march through the space. Um, sometimes that happens, you spend a lot of time in research trying to figure out Baroque interesting answers and the most dumb, simple one actually is the best performing one. <laughs> this was one of those cases. Um, so. The last thing we do, it, once we've re done all our recycling, then we go to the central pool again and say, hey, can we have some free pages? And we start using the free pages again. Okay. So opportunistic defragmentation. A key idea here is um, that we can um, opportunistically copy. So the, the IMIX itself is still exposed to, to the po possibility of fragmentation. In the worst case, you could have one object on each uh, page or uh, very small objects on lines. So you, you're still exposed to defragmentation. So you do have to have some strategy for dealing with that. It's not as, obviously, nowhere near as exposed as something like a simple mark compact algorithm if you didn't do compaction. Um, but it, there is still some exposure to it. It's not as exposed as mark sweep. But the neat thing that we have here is the possibility to opportunistically defragment, that is to um, just selectively copy things when it's convenient. Um, there are two nice properties to this, and that is that you can do it when, you're, when you can afford to do it. Another one is that you can dodge things that are, are constrained, such as objects that are pinned. So, um, <clears throat> so we have a, have a problem like this here where you see some fragmentation, you see two blocks that are, that are fragmented. And um, what we do is we opportunistically evacuate fragmented ones. Um, and uh, th there's a whole bunch of an engineering niceness there that th th we can reuse the same tools for doing the defragmentation as the exact same mechanisms that do the normal allocation. And um, it, it turns out to be very cheap. So what we need to do is we need to identify a source and a target for the block. So we're, we're going to pull these guys out of there and put them into here. This is the target. And then um, when we as we're performing the trace, when we come to, to mark the, these guys over there, we say, oh, okay, this, this has been identified as a source for evacuation. We'll opportunistically copy them into the target. So um, we, we mark the one, when we encounter that object there in the, in, in the source, we just mark it as normal because it's not a, it's not a, sorry, in the target, we just mark that as normal because it's not in the source. Um, but when we go to mark this one over here, we copy it out and place it there. And um, similarly, when, when we get the next one, we uh, copy it out and place it here. Okay, so we can defragment as we go. 
Um, now, I just realized, Dave, that the slide I thought was here isn't here. <laughs> the one explaining the, 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 that trick. Um, but I'll just move now onto the, onto the evaluation. Uh, so we evaluated this thing fairly thoroughly. We used uh, 20 benchmarks um, and we evaluated across four, four heap collectors. Those of you who are garbage collection people will be thinking, hang on, this entire talk has just been talking about whole heap collectors. Well, in practice, real systems compose um, collection strategies. They'll have a particular strategy for the large objects. They'll have a, another strategy for, for different types of objects. And very often, they'll compose it with generational collection. So, um, but this talk so far has just been about the fundamental algorithm, um, uh, which is you know, best evaluated in a full heap setting, but we evaluate it also in the generational setting. And we evaluate it on three rather different um, machines, which at the time were fairly contemporary machines. Um, the first point was to look at the mutator time. And uh, Imix in all the slides is going to be green. We keep the same colors throughout all the slides. And you can see in terms of mutated time, and here we're looking at the geometric mean of all those uh, 20 benchmarks, and, and it's just on one of the, the three machines. You see here that our, our mutated time is good. It's not quite as good as semi-space because we're not doing that, um, we're not doing that uh, copying, which uh, is uh, locating things in terms of their reachability, which is what you get with semi-space. But it's very close to the locality of Mark Compact. Okay? So semi-space is still the winner on locality. <clears throat> Uh, in terms of GC time, you see that we're, we're doing very well compared to um, Mark Sweep. Uh, in terms of total performance, clear air between all the other algorithms at each size. In the, in the, uh, sorry, I didn't explain that the fundamental axes. I, I said that right at the start. I said we have time on that axis and, and heap size on the, other, on the other axis. Here, we start at the smallest heap in which these things can run. And we go up to six times that size. So it's a very explicit time-space trade-off. Okay, so you expect as you go that way, your, your collection time uh, minim is minimal. But in the limit, as you go that, that way, you're going to lose locality because things are so stretched out in the heap. Okay, and then finally, if you look at minimum heap size, oh, Ben, yep. Yeah, uh, so what's the worst case in uh, the application? What's, for, which application gave the worst result? Yeah. No idea. Tell so which which one gave the best result? <laughs> no, I don't. Sorry, Ben, I don't remember. <laughs> but 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 it is very it is very no no. I'll give you a facetious comment. No, but I, I will in the next slide actually. There's there's more there's a little more information here, and you can see it's pretty robust, right? Um, here, in terms of minimum heap size, it's only these two here where it does worse than Mark Sweep, right? So when you see this result, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a fairly robust result. It's not like we've got a few where we really suck and, and we just make it up with a few that we do great on. It's, 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 and and that's, I believe that's, that's true across the board pretty much. There's, there's no, there's no um, real um, pathologies that it's exposed to there. There's no benchmarks where it really hurts. Um, Why is the um, viral and the clips missing? Oh. <laughs> it wouldn't run to completion on Eclipse. Uh, Eclipse is a beastly benchmark, and uh, it's the toughest benchmark of the set, and Mark Compact is the most hairy of the algorithms. At the time we were running it, the... the this, is, this is like running in a, in a heap that's, okay, that's the smallest possible heap. It's pushing it to the smallest it can do. Right, okay. Um, and I guess, I guess what came up as the smallest we knew wasn't the smallest that it could do. It was just that it was, it was the, 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 the collector was failing, um, not due to out of heap space, but due to some failure in the collector. So we just left that out. Yeah. Um, there is something interesting here. I've lost it now. There, there is one result here which is interesting. I guess it's DB. Um, where where, where, where um, Mark Impact is not the most efficient, which is counterintuitive, right? This, is, this should be a counterintuitive result. Mark Impact should always give you the most space efficient result, right? Can anyone guess what the answer to this is? All right, it's, it's a little bit obscure. So um, <laughs> I don't know about in C sharp, uh, uh, but in Java you have hashing. Um, so each object is identifiable with a hash. Okay. Now a very efficient way to do that is to use the address of the object as the hash, right? Which is great until you copy the object. 
right? And so in practice, what you do is you use one bit to, to say this object's been copied or it hasn't been copied. If it has been copied, then you need to use an extra word to say what the address of it was before you copied it so you maintain the same hash. But you, but you can even optimize further by only doing that if you know it has been hashed at any point. Okay? Now, DB does a lot of hashing. And, and then, so mark compact, well, you're moving things all the time. So if you're doing a lot of hashing, you're going to have a lot of objects, a lot of small objects with this extra word on them. So you're actually taking up more heap space. So counterintuitive result with a sort of, it, it puzzled me for a while until we dug right into that. And that was what was going on. It's address based hashing. So, all right. Um, let's move on to generational performance because that's in practice what people might care more about. Um, and you might think, oh, well, it's just 2%. But for some people, that's important. Um, and th this is the geometric mean across 20 benchmarks, OK? So it's a fairly stable result. But perhaps what's more important is um, some, well, th th this is a little bit interesting. This is a sticky, uh, sticky generational collection. Some of you know this algorithm. Um, this, this says, let's uh, do generations without moving. Okay, uh, this, the, the Bohm collected this originally. So the, uh, the idea of young and old is done by some bits rather than by, uh, by the address that the object is in. And, um, and the, the, uh, the, the way it was described by Bohm et al. was as a, they use a sticky mark bit to indicate whether something was old or young. So that's what the name sticky came, came from. Um, but what's interesting here is if you use sticky generational collection, that's a non-moving generational collection, um, and you, um, you'll see that uh, um, emix does substantially better than um, than um, mark sweep on average. Okay, so it's it's, it's an average of more, well over five percent across all these benchmarks. So uh, if you get rid of that nursery, um, then the advantage of emix is really quite quite significant. And there are cases where you want to do this, where you want to use an algorithm like the sticky one to do absolutely minimal movement, minimal copying. Um, even more interesting is to see how well sticky emix compares to what was at the time the production collector of the day. So that is this almost completely non-moving algorithm, this green one, was performing almost as well as the standard generational mark sweep collector. So that, that's a very interesting little result. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then here we see... Uh, a very specific benchmark, uh, just JBB, um, again looking at um, gen, gen uh, mark sweep versus gen emix. I showed before on average the, the advantage of gen emix wasn't great, but Ben asked before about what our worst case was. Well, this is, this is our best case, but it was interesting because at the time it was the one that industry cared about most. We didn't care for it very much, but they cared, for, cared about it a lot, so uh, we thought that was funny. We actually did very well on this, on this particular benchmark. Um, that's total time, right? So just changing the GC algorithm is improving total time by 6%. All right, so, uh, oh, and, the, and even, sorry, and even the whole heap collector, the, the dotted line here is the whole heap collector. So even the whole heap collector is doing better than the generational collector um, for once the heap size gets above a certain point. In fact, almost at every heap size, we're doing better than the generational collector on that benchmark. All right, so the prior work, as I mentioned, there was an IBM product collector. We subsequently found out that well, this wasn't actually public, but we we inferred or believed that um, the BEA collector, the J Rocker collector, was essentially Mark Region as well. But neither of these were neither of these were actually published, uh, although there were there were uh, sort of references to it without actually describing it. So, let me summarise: um, Mark Region collection. Um, it's another fundamental class of algorithm. It uses a sweep to region strategy. Emix is an instantiation of it, um, which has good locality, really good collection time, space efficient, and it's got excellent performance. So that's it. Any questions? This is the answer to today's question, which we may or may not choose to go into, but I did have the slide here. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew I had a slide for this, <laughs> which is at the end. Any questions? Yep. So, I have two questions. One, um, just out of curiosity, what's the proportional time did you know uh, for, for tracing? Uh, sorry? Proportional out of the whole of, of the actual algorithm for... Oh, 
How much time do you spend tracing versus the other components? Okay. What, say, for Mark Sweep or? Uh, sure. Well, so it dominates. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, you, so actually performing, performing the transitive closure, that, that, that completely dominates. Okay. Right. Okay, um, I believe the exact answer to your question is in a paper one of my students published at ISMM a few weeks back, uh, which does an in-depth study on the performance of the scanning loop. So it just studies exactly that part, and, but it puts it in context by saying how much the time that actually counts for. But there's this detailed analysis of, of that itty bitty, like 10 lines of code, <laughs> and the different ways you can do it. Uh, and so then another question is, what's the complexity of writing MX versus, uh, for instance, a very simple collector? All right, so writing, writing Mark region is actually easy. And that's what I said at the start when I pointed out, here's a naive one and it actually performs really well in most cases. But writing a highly tuned production quality garbage collector is a time consuming business. And Imix, I wanted to, I, I, because of the results we got, I wanted to become the production collector for Jax RVM at the time. And so the, in the way I write stuff, I do a prototype, throw it away, do another, refine it, throw it away. And the one that's in there now is the third iteration and I need to do a fourth really. And I tend to start from scratch. Um, but, so it's a non-trivial amount of work uh, to get something that's really highly tuned. And there are things like this, this here, which um, are finessing details to, to uh, we, uh, in terms of how we actually extract the performance out of it, that is very carefully documented in the paper. So if you were to read the paper, you would be, if, I believe, if you read that paper, you'd be able to implement a high performance MX garbage collector for the Java workloads that we evaluated it on. Okay, I'm not gonna claim that if you implemented it exactly like that, it would work great for JavaScript or, for your particular C sharp applications, the problem is tuning a garbage collector to to work across any application is is tough. I, I think Imix will across all the collectors I've implemented. I've implemented quite a few. Imix is pretty robust, but I'm, I'm not going to promise you that if you go and implement this thing, it's going to perform great on your workload of choice. But um, a basic implementation, if you're a keen GC coder, you could have it up and running re really quick. Then it's just finessing. And, and the other point, uh, which is kind of relevant, is key components such as the tracing loop and the allocation, that's completely orthodox, okay? So we recycle those components from other things that we already had on, on deck. One thing you haven't talked about is the uh, impact of multi-core processes yeah. on all of this. Um, sure, uh, yeah, it's a good point. Um, I guess that wasn't at the forefront of, of our mind when we wrote the paper. It is since. Um, I could try and answer that a little, or I could skip to my next talk, which there were, that's actually a major theme. But your, your call, I mean, we, we, we use this. Oh, let me say a couple of things. First of all, this, this one we evaluated here is not concurrent, but it is parallel. All of our algorithms in Drake's RVM are parallel, which meaning that when they run, they use the, 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 all, the, all the data structures they use are, uh, are thread safe and parallelized and uh, load balancing. So, well, and we've had that since day one with all of our collectors. All the ones that are evaluated here are like that. Okay, so, um, uh, so we utilize all the hardware resources we can. Um, but there are much more interesting questions to ask in a, in a, in a uh, multi-core setting than, than can, you, can you do parallel GC. And, um, I'm going to touch on that in a few minutes, so maybe we can just defer to that. Any more questions? All right, like I said before, uh, to make this interesting, instead of just talking about something I did a few years ago, uh, I'm now going to talk about things we're about to do, which are a little bit more interesting. I mean, in interesting in the sense that they haven't been done yet, and the results are a bit edgy, and some of them are, are exciting, I think. Um, but, so when... It, as a postdoc in my early academic career, I had the benefit of being part of a consortium that I guess Todd was on the edge of and Ben witnessed from industry and Dave witnessed from industry. And there was a DiCaprio, DiCaprio consortium. It was a bunch of academics who grew out of um, Catherine McKinley and Elliot Moss's group at UMass and Armour D1, who's Todd's advisor, was, was one of the faculty involved and I was involved too. But this, this had a great uh, opportunity for us to get together twice a year and we'd get up there and we'd talk about the work that we were 
doing at the time and, and, and what, we're, what we're planning to do. And we talked very freely in a room with this understanding that no one was going to scoop each other because we're all in this together. And, um, and so you could talk in a way that you can't normally talk when you go and visit somewhere else. But um, seeing as my, my primary collaborator is now amongst you, <laughs> I feel like I can, I can speak that way uh, amongst you, you all. So I'm, that's what I'm going to do next. But the understanding, of course, is that I'd prefer it not to be recorded. And, um, and um, it, that also gives us the opportunity to have a more free-ranging discussion. So um, if that's okay with you all, that's what I'd like to do now. Um, <clears throat>